this talk is going to be about uh, the Nintendo and JavaScript um, sound and other stuff. Because, uh, yeah, it's kind of going to be like a journey of like sort of how I got to um, the sound part because it didn't like originally start off with the sound. Um, so part one, starting out. Um, why a lot of people have asked me like why, like kind of why uh, I even started to do this stuff. Um, and it, I came across this quote by Brian Eno a couple days ago in my Twitter feed. And it, it, what he was saying was like, whenever you find like this weird, ugly, uncomfortable and um, nasty about a new medium, you surely it will surely become its signature. So, for example, like CD distortion, uh, like that crispy 8-bit sound. He says crap sound, but I don't really you know buy into that. But anyways, like he says all of these will be cherished and emulated as soon as they can be avoided. So you get people like collecting tapes um, and doing weird stuff with that. And like you get the whole 8-bit uh, pixel art stuff, um, even like the, there's people that are really into like polygon art of like the 90s like ps1 style stuff um but yeah basically it's the this is another great little, little quote right here it's the sound of failure so so much modern art is a sounding of things going out of control of a medium being like pushed to the limits and then like breaking apart distorted guitar sounds and all that stuff so i really really love this quote because like it it's so much about i think what this talk is kind of about and like what the whole um like diy movement of like getting to this old hardware and really like hacking around with it and stuff so yeah i really really love this quote um but basically like the the three things are the reasons why is nostalgia um i really like the creative limitations of working with uh, a nintendo because it's um you're super limited on ram and the processor was kind of horrible for it even for its time like it was a just a cheap processor that nintendo um you know used and it, it didn't really couldn't really do a whole lot of things but they were very very creative in making things work well um and it's fun so the goals uh, at the start was not to write like a um like sound stuff it was to write a compiler and like i kind of failed at that um and I wrote this thing called Nestle, which was kind of horrible. Um, the code was not very good. Uh, it wasn't really a compiler. Um, it didn't work very well. It used a JS parser um, to make an abstract syntax tree, and then it would compile chunks of uh, like of your JavaScript or whatever into 6502 uh, assembler, and it didn't really work very well um but i learned a lot because i had to read a ton of stuff on how to uh get this working um so i would um this is like one of the cool things about the internet it like there's so much of this uh like knowledge that is hidden like that you really really have to go spelunking and dig through forms and old txt files from like the mid 90s and uh it reminded me um i started this like uh probably like five years ago um, but at the time it reminded me of being a kid again, because when I was a kid growing up and I got like my first computer and we got an internet access, um, this was sort of how I got into like programming and whatever Linux and all that sort of stuff was you would find on the internet, like when you were like searching for things like, or using Alta Vista or whatever to search around for things, you'd find these sites that had like these txt files from like you know i don't know like how to hack a vms whatever and like you would learn about like all these things and tcp and like unix and all this stuff that was like at the time super foreign to you um but over time and reading these txt files that these people had put together it was like very very insightful so that's what it felt like um to make a long story short like that's this project like it it was horrible and like I haven't touched it in like four years, but it, it really got me like interested in this stuff and it was a stepping stone um, onto all the other projects that I'm going to talk about later. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of form reading and uh, and a lot of reading about the processor specifically and how, how it works and all that. So just for a little bit of background about the 6502. 
Um, the processor is it's the same one that um, let's see, I think Atari Commodore sixty four, um, the Apple II used it. So it was a pretty common processor in the late seventies. Um, so when Nintendo picked it up in uh, eighty four um, and released it in the um, the NES, um, it was kind of old already and. Uh, it wasn't super powerful at the time. So that's sort of where like the limitation comes in um, and all that. So anyways, moving on. So what this, what came out of this was, um, this was the, this is like the first thing that I ever did. Um, it's, this is a screenshot of like when I got things kind of working. And this is a ROM that I compiled um, using Nestle and I used the Super Mario Brothers sprite sheet, um, and I actually made a Nintendo binary. And uh, it's running in an emulator uh, in Nestopia. And uh, yeah, so it's like, I don't actually have this ROM anymore, and I don't know if I can, I could probably dig through GitHub to find the code to recompile it, but um, I have a similar or demo that I can show off in just a sec. Um, but yeah, this is like a time capsule uh, from like four years ago when I first got this stuff working. Um, I'm going to try to switch uh, my screen sharing over to a different screen so that I can show off a, another demo. This is a um, this is a demo made from Nestle and the Super Mario sprite sheet. Um, so some. This is very similar to the screenshot that I showed you, except I have like this Goomba character here. I fixed the Mario color, but I could never get like if you look in the upper left hand corner, there's like um, a little piece of Mario's head. I could never figure there was that was a bug and I could never figure it out. Um, yeah, I have no idea. You'll notice that some of the blocks are green. Um, it was a bug. I fixed it one night and then it regressed and I have no idea how it works. Like it's it's lost to the ether. Um, it would so that that was another thing that was never really fixed, but I did get controller input working. So I'm like moving the Goomba around. Um, this was really cool. Uh, it was actually pretty easy to get controller input working on this stuff. Um, but yeah. So, anyways, back to that. I just wanted to show like okay, that was like the the highlight of what I could uh, I could do with. Um, with, let's see, where is my, there we go. Sorry. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, so out of, out of that, after I got like that stuff working, um, I worked on these two, uh, modules to sort of help out doing stuff to a binary Nest ROM. So the first one was Nestle split, which was super helpful in actually getting the data out of like uh, ROMs that I needed, like for example, a lot of the demos that I was do using the the Super Mario Brothers uh, sprite sheet file, which is called the character file or the CHR. Um, so basically, how a Nintendo ROM is assembled is you have like a a certain portion of the of the memory is um, dedicated to um, the character file, and then another huge, bigger, much bigger chunk of it is called the program file or or the PRG and uh, that's what what is the actual game so I wanted to be able to like split those out and uh, and then I could use the character file for uh, doing demos and stuff and loading it up in my own programs um, and then also like say you wanted to um, like change up a uh, like go into the Super Mario file, change it up, and then split it back in. I made Nestle meld, so it will kind of it'll just like meld it back into where it's supposed to be in uh, in the buffer. Um, so yeah, so those those two things were super helpful. Um, but before we get into like the sounds stuff, I want to like uh, just kind of like recap. Like I learned a ton about like assembler from this. Um, I learned a ton of that about how the processor worked, um, but at the time, uh, I didn't really do any of the sound stuff because it seemed way too hard. Like I didn't, um, I had read about it a little bit just on form posts and stuff, but I mostly stuck to like graphics and control stuff um, just because those were the 
things that I was able to get to work and sound stuff just seemed hard. So I didn't, I kind of skipped it. Um, but then fast forward a couple years later, um, I took another look at sound stuff and, uh, because I thought, you know, it would be cool. And I don't know, every couple of years I kind of do something else Nintendo related just to kind of, you know, keep things fun and stuff. And I was surprised because sound was so much easier and I wish I would have like just done it from the beginning. So I dropped everything that I was doing and I updated my goal. Instead of writing a compiler, I wanted to make it easier to make sounds on a Nintendo. Um, and because uh, it, I thought it was going to be hard and then it turned out to be like a lot easier, like it was much more fulfilling and I actually got things up and running and working like a lot quicker. Um, and I guess because like I had gone through Nestle stuff and uh, actually knew a little bit about what I was doing. Um, so let's learn about like some Nintendo audio processing unit stuff. Um, so there's, uh, let's see, there's I think five channels. So you have two square channels, um, a triangle noise, channel and then you have a sampler channel but the sampler channel is uh I, I never did anything with it because it takes up a lot of memory and um it's to me it just wasn't super interesting um to get going but i guess that could be a feature added or whatever um let's go through some demos so i hope these sound okay because uh i'm just going to be piping it into to my mic from my laptop speakers so this is um, what a square sounds like. Okay, so what that was is um, it. I have a uh, I have a compiled Nintendo ROM that using Nestle Sound, um, which has a JavaScript API, um, can output. Uh, or can write to the the square channel of a Nintendo. So that was actually running in a Nintendo emulator. It's kind of hard to show you on here, um, but that's what a square uh, sounds like. So it has a duty cycle, which changes like the where the the wave you know goes or whatever. Um, you can adjust that with the Nestle Sound API. Um, it does volume envelopes, so you can do things like um, staccato and uh, and just you know cut up the like change the volume like however much you want in a cycle so um you can get weird like echo blips and all sorts of things which i'll demo in a sec um triangle uh is just binary on the volume envelope thing so there isn't a volume envelope it's basically just on and off um but here let's do a triangle demo <laughs> So that's just going through like the different octaves of the of the triangle, and then you have the noise. Let's show off some noise. Um, noise is just like random noise stuff. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so you could do like drums. You could do like if like a character gets hit or something, or you know, metallic-y sounds and stuff. Um, cool. I'm going to share my terminal window to show off some code. Maybe. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, okay. So let's look at, let's look at, uh, square because we just, yeah. So this is what, this is what that, the square, um, that you just heard, this is what the code looks like. Um, so I I can, you know, create an instance of Nestle Sound. Um, channels are on the, the instance that you created. Um, I can pass it in, uh, it takes, so it, it will take a uh, an array of notes. So I can, right now I'm passing it in C um, I'm changing the time, timing to make them um, quarter notes. And I'm just looping through uh, and changing the octave. And then calling done and then write. Uh, this is sort of a weird API, but there's a reason for it. Um, but anyways, 
so yeah, so it's it's not not super hard. You're just passing in a an array array of notes. I want to show like another more like complexy. Um, so this this is a uh, like a little really simple like just um, some stuff going on, changing octaves around and stuff. Um, so just have an array of notes on a couple different channels. Um, and passing those into each each one of these here. These are separate channels, so it's using two square channels and a triangle channel. Um, it's doing stuff, setting some weird hex stuff um, for the tempo. That's kind of just passing that straight through to assembly. Uh, I never really got around to making like um, like decimal integers out of these, which it's probably not super hard to do, but I just never did it. Um, so here, uh, I'll show. So that 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 we just saw is sounds like this. All right. Um, cool. Um, okay. So, so that was like the first like song type thing that I did, and that was like, oh, whoa, whoa! Like this is interesting because I can I can actually uh, like just like if I have like some music or whatever, I can start like transcribing stuff or whatever. I didn't really know how to read music at that point. Um, I just kind of was winging it. Um, but my brother was a lot better at this stuff than than me, so uh, I went over to his house and um, we we did some stuff and um, we wrote some tunes together. Um, but eventually, like I started writing some some other stuff. Like, uh, let's see, what's a good one to show? Um, I'll do the the soup. So I I started doing the Super Mario one. It kind of wasn't sounding exactly like I wanted, but because I was transcribing it from this like sheet music that I found on the internet. Um, but so I just started kind of like making a remix of it or whatever. So here's here's that. <laughs> Okay. Um cool. Uh let's see. I'll do like one more demo or um Oh, is are there like any Slayer fans in Portland? Let's see. Um, yeah, okay, Raining Blood. And that, that's it, because that's how that whole song goes. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Okay, let's do one more. Um, this is, uh, I don't know, some, some Bach something or other. of that um so let's see what can i show um just want to show like one last time so you can't really create chords um because uh you can only play like one note at a time it's monophonic so you can kind of fake it by using different channels to to play notes at the same time but it's not going to sound great all the time because your triangle channel is sounds much different than the, your square channels. Um, but what you can do is you can use like little tricks and stuff like um, 
make a C major and like, or like an arpeggio or something and uh, like speed up like the timing or the tempo intermittently or whatever and, and all that stuff. Um, so there, there's tricks to like, to, to do all of this stuff. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Um, let's see. Show off like the, you can also like, um, so you can set the duty cycle like on the square channel. Like here's an example of that. You can just like do like, it has like a chained API. So if you do like dot timing, you can change the timing whenever you want. You can do dot duty. And in this example, it's just going through, it's playing a C, it's playing a C with an octave of four at quarter timing. But what it's doing is it's looping through this duty cycle array and changing that there. So I don't know, just to give you an example, if you don't know what like changing the duty cycle on a square channel sounds like, which I didn't before I did this, um, here's that. So it's just the same note, like, and the only thing is just, you're just like, it'd be like if you had a synthesizer and you could just had a knob that changed the duty cycle. Okay, let's go, let me switch my screen again. Okay, cool. Part three. So that was the Nestle sound stuff. Um, there's definitely more examples, I guess, that I didn't show. I didn't really show off volume envelopes. Uh, you can do things like echo, blips, all that. Um, what else am I forgetting? Yeah, anyways, there, there's more stuff to, to get on to. So after I did that, um, I did the sound stuff. Um, it was super fun. I had a great time. I was writing little music and blips and I wrote a couple of things like uh, to do like random music and that was fun and all of this was cool because like I could de I could actually demo it to people on like real Nintendo hardware um, and so I got this cart uh, this cartridge from uh, from someone um, and it has like a like a SD uh, card um, thing in the top so I could load up ROMs onto an SD card and then plug them in and then run them on a real Nintendo. So going places and having it run on real hardware was always super cool because it was, it's like, no, this is actually, it really works on a Nintendo. It's not just some like trickery or, um, or whatever. It's actually running on a real Nintendo. Um, right now I'm running everything on an emulator just because that's easier to do remotely um but yeah for all of this stuff like really really will run on a, a real nintendo um so part three um parsers and assemblers um so after a couple years after the sound stuff um i there's there had been some stuff doing um the sound stuff that i was frustrated with um one of it was that I was still using, um, I, I would still have to use uh, a 6502 assemblers that were usually written in C or C++. Um, so that was that was a difficult part of the, the tool chain, right? Because if you, you had, um, it's hard to get people to use an API if then they have to go in and like install this other program and then like it compiles down to this assembler, but then you need this other program to actually build it into a bin binary file. Um, so I started, you know, looking into what I needed to complete the tool chain in JavaScript. And one, I needed a 6502 parser. Um, and then two, I needed a, a uh, an assembler um, a, in pure JavaScript. So I started writing the uh, the parser, um, and I, I finished it, and it it works. Um, it's it's called parser uh, dash sixty five hundred two. Uh, it's a parser written in JavaScript that will parse assembler written for the sixty five hundred two eight bit microprocessor. Um, so an example is uh, you, you have some input that is like um, looks like some assembler junk and then you get output like in the form of like a, you know, AST or not quite. It's basically an array of directives and stuff and arguments. Um, 
So this was super cool. Uh, this I had never really written a parser um, like like this before, um, and it it actually was super easy and fun. And I used this uh, really cool library called Mona, and uh, it it was really 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 fun to write. And I recommend people go out and write parsers because they're fun. Um, so so yeah. So this this. Um, got me into also into thinking about like how I could hook all of this stuff up together. Um, because once I, once I had like these two things in place, I could really, I could really integrate them into all of the other modules that I either had built or intend to build. Like Nestle sound could just include a parser and, or actually not just the assembler because the assembler could use the parser. So Let's go, yeah, I kind of skipped this part. Like, so I started writing um, an assembler called Nestle Assembler. And it is a JavaScript assembler for 6502 assembler. Um, so it'll take assembler code such as this junk um, and it will parse it and then it will give you a binary as output. Um, so, so this was sort of hard and I was out of my like comfort zone. Um, I found this. Uh, I found this project called NodeNess, um, which it was uh, written by this awesome guy uh, or this awesome person, uh, Guto, and he had um, he had made this like these tools in JavaScript for doing exactly this, but it was more uh, like a complete tool set of like. Um, kind of like an editor and like some other stuff uh, included. And I wanted just the assembler part. So I contacted him and I was like, hey, like, like this is awesome. I love this stuff. Uh, like I wanna like, um, I wanna split out the assembler and stuff and he was totally cool with it. So I was like, okay. Um, so yeah, so we, uh, we split out the assembler code and into Nestle assembler, um, changed a bunch of stuff, rewrote a bunch of stuff and then now this part that I'm at now is I've got it working, um, but now I want to um, rewrite the parser part of Nestle Assembler to use the parser 6502. So then it'll be completely like done, done, done. And then it'll be, the next step would be to integrate this into Nestle Sound. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, I'm open to questions. You could ask me now or ask me on the Twitter or whatever. Thank you for having me. Does anyone have any questions for Michael? So how does this work on like an actual N Nintendo system? Do you use like a, a controller to like send the sound? Uh, no. So, so the way this works on an actual Nintendo is you have to write the JavaScript. Uh, you have to actually write the JavaScript, run it, and it will give you a, well, right now it'll give you a build folder of assembler. And then you have to use an, an assembler to assemble it to make an actual binary. And then, like I was saying, uh, I have a cart that, will take the SD card that I can put on there, but you can just also run it in an emulator. But yeah, you actually have to run it and assemble it. It's, there's, there's not really, the thing is with the Nintendo, so there's no, like, I mean, there's the controller, but um, there's not like a network port or anything or USB or whatever. So I have seen, um, there's this person, uh, what's his, his, his Twitter handle, I think is Batsley Adams, um, who has this cool hardware hack uh, where he like, you can solder on like this component in onto, um, or into your Nintendo. And he has this software that will do like live reading of the memory and allowing you to change uh, change the memory um, in real time, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, 
there's also like MIDI controller stuff that you, so like there's carts that will uh, that have MIDI on them, and you can plug your like a like if you wanted to. This was just a wacky JavaScript project. So, but if you wanted to like really get into it and like use it as like a uh, like an instrument or something, there are carts that like are basically MIDI controllers that you could that have software and stuff that you can um, you know play with a MIDI, regular MIDI controller. Any other questions? I think that's everything. Thanks, Michael. Awesome. Thank you.